Sermon 202, True Love Chapel here, looking at John chapter 18, and this is going to be, my kingdom is not of this world. Let's pray. God, please bless the sermon. Please help us, Lord God. Strengthen your church. Please teach us, Lord God, and encourage us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. John chapter 18, verses 33 on to 40. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world... My servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So this is one of the last uh, things before Jesus gets uh, crucified. He had just been arrested. In the beginning of chapter 18, we see that um, in verse 3. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So they went there to the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. A band of soldiers there means a band of Roman soldiers. And they also had some of the Jews with them as well. So Pilate already knew about Jesus. He had to approve, you know, he had to okay that uh, band of soldiers to go arrest him. He had heard that Jesus was a big troublemaker, that he was dangerous, and he needed to be arrested. And so here he is um, finally seeing Jesus face to face after hearing about him so much from the Jews that he was so dangerous. Um, and he, you know... He says uh, to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? He seems kind of, uh, Pilate questioning him, seems kind of uh, a little surprised by the looks of Jesus. He was expecting a criminal or a uh, revolutionary or something like that. Some, uh, you know, and he's dealt with those kind of people before. But he sees Jesus who comes in quietly and... Um, you know, it doesn't look like the doesn't look the part. So he's kind of uh, questioning him, and um, <clears throat> you know, this was of course this was after the uh, the uh, trial, which was at Caiaphas, the uh, high priest's house. So they were not supposed to have a trial at his house. It was supposed to be in the Sanhedrin. They had the original trial in his house, which was illegal. Then they had the they went back to the Sanhedrin to, you know, sentence him. Though the trial was actually held in, in the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. And uh, they were also not allowed to have a trial at night. This was done at night, which also made it illegal and invalid. And then also um, they were not allowed to try a capital, mur a capital case. That was a case that could result in death the punishment of death the jews were not allowed to uh to do that during the passover so now rome could do it and rome was doing it they were crucifying people um, but the jews were not allowed to to send someone to death during uh passover so it was an illegal trial to begin with it, it was rigged and um <clears throat> Of course, Jesus knew that that was what was going to happen, and Jesus gladly allowed himself to be arrested um, because that was his purpose, to uh, to fulfill his work. He had to die on the cross. 
says that uh, back to you know Pilate questioning uh, Jesus. Now Pilate had questioned him in the first place. Uh, in the book of John, it has these two separate things from 28 to 32, Jesus before Pilate, and then from 33 on is is again Jesus before Pilate. There's something in between where Jesus got sent to Herod. So Herod was the uh, the ruler of the region of Galilee, and um, Pilate wanted to send Jesus to Herod, hoping that Herod would take care of it. Pilate didn't want anything to do with it, but Herod sent him back to Pilate. So here he is again, asking him, what has he done? You know, are you the king of the Jews? That's the main thing that Pilate wants to know, because um, for all... For all a pilot cares about is they have one king they think, and it's Caesar. They care about the political kingdom, and uh, you know the Jews were allowed to exist, but they have to, um, they still have to be in submission under Caesar. So that was their political king, and that's what Pilate his job was to enforce that. So he's really questioning Jesus more about. Um, whether he is a king or not, you know, he hasn't really heard of any big crimes this guy has done. He's heard that he was uh, inciting a rebellion or something like that. So he wants to know, is he a king? Verse 34, Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? So the answer, Jesus' answer could be different depending on who's asking the question. In other words, if Pilate is asking the question himself, are you a king? Pilate would mean a political king, you know, in competition with Caesar. To that, Jesus could answer no. Because Jesus was not, he did not come as a political ruler. He came as a suffering servant, but he's also the, um, the kingdom, the king of not just the Jews, but the kingdom of God. So, a spiritual kingdom, not a earthly political one. So, if, if Pilate was asking the question, he could have said no. If the chief priests, if Caiaphas was asking the question, um, is he the messianic king of the Jews, um, the Messiah? To that, of course, Jesus could say yes. So that's different. And the, the Messiah, the Old Testament prophesies that the Messiah will be God himself. And, um, and that God himself will come and, um, and save, save Israel. He saves Israel. He saves uh, also Gentile, Jew and Gentile alike. But he saves them in a spiritual sense, not simply a political, governmental kind of way. So, who's asking the question? And on verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? So, yeah, he's saying basically that it's the Jews that are, you know, accusing him. Pilate really doesn't want anything to do with it. It's your own nation, it's the Jews, the chief priests. So, what have you done? He's just trying to figure out. Now, what has Jesus done? That's a <laughs> that's a loaded question. What did Jesus do? He lived the perfect life. He did not sin. He they couldn't pinpoint anything that he had done wrong, really, because he lived the perfect life. So, any attempt at uh, you know falsely accusing him, those accusations fall short. They don't hold up to scrutiny because he actually he did nothing wrong. He lived a perfect life. Um, completely without sin. He was able to do that because he is, of course, um, God incarnate. The fullness of deity dwelt in bodily form in Christ. He's, uh, he was born of the Virgin Mary. He did not inherit the sin nature, the fallen nature that man has, and that man has had since the fall, since the, in the Garden of Eden, when man sinned, and now all humanity is tainted with sin but Jesus did not have that he is born he has the divine godly nature 
He's 100% God and 100% man. So he, um, he, he was able to, to not commit sin. He also committed, uh, or he worked many miracles. He healed the sick. He uh, gave sight to the blind. The lame were able to walk again when he healed them. Lepers were healed. Um, so he did many mighty good works. And then he also taught the truth with authority. Truth that, like people had never heard before. They were wondering, who is this man? How did he receive this you know, wisdom and knowledge? He taught in the synagogues. The Jews were, were shocked. You know, and they want to know who is this guy, where is he from, how did he, how did he learn this? But, I mean, Jesus taught like nobody has ever taught before, and Jesus taught with the the highest level of moral excellence and love. Those are ultimately what it comes down to. Jesus taught us what it means to love, and. Uh, what it, what it means to be perfect, which includes love and doing the right thing at all times. So Jesus has done amazingly good things. And um, they're accusing him of crimes. They can't really pinpoint. They don't even know what exactly they're accusing him of. I think Pilate is starting to pick up the picture here is that the, uh, the, the Jews are jealous of Jesus. Pilate, I think he picked up on that, and he knew that they were trying to kill him because they were jealous, not because he had done something wrong. Well, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the, the world. His kingdom is from heaven. It's spiritual. It's above the world. His, his uh, kingdom is based in peace and truth and love, different from the world's kingdoms, which uh, are based out of greed and uh, power and um, control and just power. What is, I already said power, but I mean uh, strength, like military strength, political power and influence, uh, wealth. You know, those are the things that the world's kingdoms are based off of. And, you know, you can judge the strength of a kingdom by how big its army is, how much money it has, how many people are there, uh, what kind of supplies they have. So that would determine, you know, how effective they can be in war to wage war. If a country is unstoppable in war, then it can be a very powerful con con uh, country or kingdom in the earthly sense but jesus says his kingdom is not of this world if it was his servants would have been fighting but so he's saying it's a completely different kind of kingdom it's not based out of struggle for power it is based in peace and is based in love and truth and unlike the world's kingdoms which are um, finite the the uh, heavenly kingdom is infinite so it's eternal it goes on and on you know Rome didn't last the, the, the Roman Empire fell after this but the Christian kingdom is still going strong so God's kingdom it doesn't pass away it's eternal and uh it's just totally uh, different, and, and that's why Jesus came uh, into the world. He he stepped into this world from another, from the heavenly realm, and that he was, you know, he existed for all eternity. He is God. Jesus is God. He's the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has existed eternally, and all things were created by him through him and for him and uh, <clears throat> so but it's an interesting thing that he comes to allow himself to be uh, mocked and beat up and uh, killed and he doesn't fight back 
but he is fighting in a spiritual sense. You know, he completely defeated the devil on that cross at Calvary. Um, <clears throat> the, the last great enemy is death, and Jesus, d you know, defeated that that enemy of death by giving us this uh, beautiful gift of eternal salvation <clears throat> because of what he did on that cross. So, Jesus says, uh, My kingdom is not from the world. Verse 37, Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? So, um, so it's a it's a battle of truth you know that's that's where the war is fought here it's not in the physical realm it's in it's in the you know the truth what people believe you know whether you believe the truth if you're on the side of the truth if you are on the of the truth you listen to Jesus's voice um, and if you are not, if you have fallen for the lies of the devil, then you don't listen to him. It's it's really, it's just that. It's that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities and powers in the high places. So there's a spiritual war raging of good versus evil. And, you know, you've got the, the evil that is trying to influence the way you think, what you believe. Because, it, you know, the devil knows that if he can convince you to not accept Christ as your Savior, then you'll be lost for all eternity. And that's sort of what the devil is after, is causing the most destruction he can. Um, because that's evil. That's the opposite of good. God, on the other hand, is, is um, full of love, mercy, and grace, and truth. But... It says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So, it's it really has to do with, you know, whether your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life or not. Because if it is, you will you will pursue the truth wherever it follows, wherever it goes. And, um, and um, you know, nowadays people have a weird idea about truth. You know, if you really want to go down to it okay let me give you some examples here i have a i know a couple of guys honestly more than you would think uh, how many two guys who say they believe in the flat earth which personally i don't even think they believe in flat earth i think they just think it's cool to be weird and have weird beliefs so they just think that's cool but uh According to them, they believe in a flat earth. And, um, and I'm telling them that I don't believe in a flat earth. And sure, we can talk about them, any number of reasons why I believe the earth is round or spherical. But um, one of them guys in particular, um, so we were going to talk about, we're going to debate about the various points of, of uh, you know, information data that we can uh, examine in favor of flat earth or in favor of a uh, spherical earth and which one is true so which one is right and which one is wrong okay but this guy could not understand the concept that there has to be that they can't both be right this is what i'm saying he thought that they could uh, both be right <laughs> like that doesn't even make sense that's con self-refuting contradictory contradictory two opposite things cannot both be right at the same time the earth is either flat or it's round or it could be something else if it was a square for example then we could both be wrong but we cannot both be right it cannot be flat and round at the same time so that just comes to the nature of truth and uh, so truth is not what I think it is. Truth is truth regardless of what you think it is. 
truth is an accurate representation of the way reality is factually and uh, actually is so that's truth um if the earth is flat or let I me mean, excuse me if the earth is round and i say it's round that's true if the earth is round and i say it's flat that is false i mean this is this is like kindergarten level logic here but uh i think you would now after talking to that guy about it i went and i asked a few other people and i just wanted them to know if they understood that two contradictory um, thing accounts of reality cannot both be true at the same time in the same way. Do they understand? Um, maybe it's the way I was explaining the question, but uh, several people could not get past that. They thought that reality is just whatever you think it is. And that there's no absolute ultimate anything that's true so that's that's a huge step backwards in uh human thought in this in the 21st century that enough people are that uh, dare i say brain dead from social media tv uh radio music movies whatever it is that's that's dumbing them down but they cannot understand simple concept like that so it's a little difficult to discuss worldviews if you can't get past the basic um, first level of logic there. But we'll say that truth is an accurate representation of the way reality actually is. Okay, so reality actually exists. And, and to acknowledge that for what it is, that's true. Or to say something that is going against reality that's false. But the reality is what it is, whether you believe it or not. You don't have to believe it for it to be true. It simply is true. You can rewind all the way back to the very beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. And um, so the ultimate source of all creation has to start from somewhere. You know. There's a, that is truth. There has to be something eternal because the universe is not eternal. Um, the universe was created. Anything that was created has a cause. And so that there has to be an ultimate source of everything. And if you think of it that way, that is truth because that is God. So God is truth. And then everything that God created is truth dependent upon him so yeah it gets kind of deep and i just just want to think that's plenty i don't want to say anything else about that right now i'm trying to confuse everybody logic is a little confusing sometimes um back to our passage um so everyone who is on the side of truth hears my voice talking about jesus it has to do with the holy spirit the holy spirit has to call you um and it's, it's really a question of the will more than the mind. If you have a willingness to follow truth wherever it leads you. And uh, if you have a willingness to answer that call. And to put aside your own uh, thoughts about it. Your own desires. You think this and that. Well, I want to do it my way, for example. If you put that aside and say, I just want to follow God. Because I know God is real. You know, and uh, ultimately, the the truth is that we are sinners and that um, we deserve death. But Jesus died on the cross for us, and as the Holy Spirit calls us, we answer that call by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, and we are saved by God's grace, and we receive it through faith in Jesus Christ. We go on our passage here. It says, uh, after this. Um, after he had said this, after Pilate had said what is truth, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. So it's not just saying I find nothing worthy of death. He's saying I find no guilt at all in this guy. There's nothing he did wrong. Verse 39, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. 
So do you want me to release to the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. And um, Barabbas, the name of Barabbas, it, it sounds like, it doesn't actually mean, but it sounds like, in the original language, son of the father. And Jesus being the true son of the father. So Barabbas is a false uh, son of the father, sort of a foreshadowing of, or a, you know, a, a representation of the Antichrist, which is a false son of the father. And of course, G Barabbas was actually guilty. He was a robber. All of us are guilty. We've all committed sins. The actual cross that Jesus hung on was most likely Barabbas's cross. It was prepared for him. And, um, and then they released Barabbas and Jesus hung on that cross in his place. So that's that's some very, uh, you know, interesting stuff there. If we want to see in this story which one is like us, you know, you got Pilate, you got Jesus, you got the Jews, you got uh, Barabbas. Well, we're Barabbas in this story. We are the sinners who deserve to go to the cross and... Um, Jesus just stepped in in our place and took the punishment upon himself to pay for our sins. It says Barabbas was a robber, but we are guilty of any number of sins. We all lie, cheat, steal, and do all kind of bad stuff. So, but Jesus being perfect, he, he um, being perfect and being fully God, and like I said, fully God and fully man, so the way for God to be um, just unlimited in mercy, but also justice at the same time, is just to take the punishment upon himself. And um, he died on the cross as specifically as a sacrifice for us to pay the price of our sins. And so that he's offering this as a gift to us. Come and take it, you know, um, Whosoever will, let him drink the water of life freely. If you want eternal life, you simply come to Jesus. You trust in him, what he did on the cross. There's nothing you can do to add to that. Your salvation is entirely based on what Jesus did on the cross. The only thing we do is respond in faith to that. By accepting that gift in faith. And that's it. Then you got your salvation. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, there's more we could say about that, how we live out the Christian life and stuff. You want to uh, you want to be uh, in the kingdom of God, you know, fighting for the kingdom of God. So you want to try to do the right things and stuff like that. But your salvation is not based on doing uh, the right things. It's just based on what Jesus did. And we only have to put our faith in him to receive that gift. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for this sermon. Please help us to put our faith in Jesus Christ in um, sincerity. Please save us, Lord God. Thank you for the gift of salvation we have in Jesus Christ. Let us experience it for ourselves and let us share this with others. Let us give our testimony and witness to others that more people would be uh we pray that more people will be drawn to, to Christ and to salvation. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.